This is the Anchor Bar in downtown Detroit. It is legendary among us news folks, and it's just blocks from the Detroit News and Free Press buildings. So these walls have heard a lot of spirited shop talk over the years. 20 years ago, as the new century loomed, revolutionary change was coming to the news media, and in particular to newspapers. Subscriptions were down, technology was displacing workers, and an infant digital world was about to set off an earthquake of change. What escalated this battle was the Detroit News' decision today to change the way its guild employees and reporters are paid. Wages would be based on merit. This is blatant hooliganism. I was standing out there protecting my job. Sometimes it's one strike and you're out. When the strike began, and everybody saw it coming on July 13th, 1995, I was asked, I think on WDIV, how long it would last. And I said, one day, two days, or forever. And forever was actually more like it. In 1995, 20 years ago, union workers at Detroit's two newspapers walked out and hit the picket line. When I say newspaper strike, uh, Detroit newspaper strike, what are the first things that pop to mind? Well, you know, it was a nightmare. It was, uh, you know, a year and a half to three years of of just absolute uh, hell have you worked in this business in this town. The hair stands up on the back of my neck. I mean, I, it, this was one of the pivotal uh, episodes in my professional career. Um, I was a 24-year-old schools reporter uh, at the Free Press when it started. The strikers were a diverse group of six different unions, everyone from columnists and reporters to printing press operators and delivery drivers. It seemed that wide array of talents and skills were the very people that churning out a daily newspaper requires. With them off the job, it was a tall order to put out a daily paper, and the strikers were counting on that. No paper means no readers. No readers means no impact for advertisers. No ads means, well, no paper. We were successful in getting hundreds of businesses to withdraw their advertising. Hundreds of thousands of readers canceled with the news and free press, and to this day, the news and free press never have come close to recovering that lost business. Susie Elwood was the vice president for marketing for the Detroit newspaper agency at the time. Our objective was to uh, continue to print and publish the newspaper and get them delivered. Some people were afraid to come to work um, and there was a picket line out front so um, that's a scary proposition to walk through uh, when, you know, you're being yelled at, spit at, and, you know, those kinds of things. Reporters found themselves the subject of the biggest news story in town, like free press writer Ellen Krieger, who saved her strike memorabilia and donated it to the Walter Ruther Library at Wayne State. I even donated my picket sign that I had made the first week of the strike. It said, I used to write until I was wronged. As days stretched into weeks, some high-profile names like Mitch Album crossed the picket line. The papers considered it a coup when he walked back in, in the door. I think they figured, look, this is a sign of a tremendous crack uh, in the ranks on the other side. Striking reporter Bill McGraw returned to the free press after the strike ended, working alongside others who went back sooner. Some people, if they hadn't gone back and gotten a job, their kids would have had to drop out of college. And, um, you know, um, I really tried to be understanding about that. Uh, there were other people who, uh, to the extent I knew, really didn't have to go back, could have found another job. Uh, I was a little more disappointed, so it was really case by case. Uh, overall, I uh, was sorry that anybody went back, uh, either to take their own job or came from another city to steal a job of someone who was out on strike. On a weekend that is traditionally for celebrating the role of labor in America, this holiday is a somber one for these strikers and their families. National news that look at us, it's just a little strike, but to us it's a big Labor Day. My memory of the Labor Day is how determined we were to get the newspaper out um, and that we were going to go to um, extreme measures to do so. Um, and I think what people remember about that is the uh, sound of the helicopters landing at the, what we call the North Plant then to pick up those newspapers and get them out. Barbara Ingalls was a member of the typographical union. 
shock that they would they would turn an army on to their workers, guys in cutoffs in t-shirts in the summer facing up against guards with complete riot gear on, with the big fans with the pepper spray that they were blowing into the crowds. It was unimaginable to me that it was happening. Had they come back after Labor Day, this would have been a short strike, uh, would have got a contract, if there have been disruptions up the road, it would have been inevitable. We'd have come to the same place eventually, but not with, you know, such, such damage. But, you know, after that it became, I thought, you know, I compared it to the Confederacy. You had a lot of people sort of rallying around this glorious lost cause with no hope of, of winning it. By 1997, the unions offered to return to work and the papers agreed to take them back as needed. I remember walking into that building after almost three years, and it was the happiest day in three years, certainly, but one of the happiest days of my life because I had missed it so much. Labor disputes are often bitter, and sure enough, the strike led to deep divisions that ended friendships and reshaped the newsrooms in ways that are still felt today. The strike also provided, well, perhaps forced is a better word, technological change. Delivery was difficult, so the newspapers hustled to launch their websites. The strike paper, the Detroit Sunday Journal, started online too. And that started in, uh, in the library of my house over in Woodbridge. Uh, so uh, every night after uh, the reporters would all write their stories, we would edit them there and I would put it all together on the website and, and republish it in the morning. So there were people coming and going at all hours of the night. Uh, my wife was not pleased uh, by about the fourth or fifth week of this, that uh, a lot of uh, very inebriated uh, journalists were, <laughs> were in our house at two and three in the morning. It is hard to calculate the fallout from the newspaper strike. Certainly, circulation dropped. And the tragedy that one thing that people who know about the newspaper industry know is that Unlike smoking, cigarette, uh, unlike cigarette smoking, newspaper reading is a habit that's very easy to give up. When people stop taking a newspaper, they almost never come back. But newspaper readership declined across the country. A number of talented people, like columnist Susan Watson, never returned. Good afternoon, classified okay. advertising. Some argue the strike helped suburban papers and publications like Our Detroit and the Metro Times thrive. And watching the horror of what happened in Detroit spurred other major newspapers across the country to reach contracts with their workers. I think it's fair to ask if the union should have taken the bait and gone on strike. I don't know what the other, I don't know legally what they could have done, lawsuits, whatever, you know, work actions. Um, I think that's really a fair question. We had no choice. No, I don't see how we could have changed anything if we were still going to have employees represented by labor unions. Uh, for us, it was a matter of survival. We were trying to introduce efficiencies, knowing what was you know, coming in the industry, and now you look back 20 years later and it's like, whoa, we, we didn't even really know. I don't have a single regret of what happened, and I don't think very many people do. You know, Maybe we shouldn't have gone out, but we did, and I think if more people stood up to corporate greed the way that we did, and we held out for nearly six years, and I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of my fellow strikers every day, but you know, I look back at it and it's like, did I really go through that? Oh my God. <laughs> Nobody won the strike. Nobody won. I mean, the unions were more defeated, but nobody won. Everybody lost in this. Most wars are like that. I'd say it's hard to argue with that. You know, author Chris Romberg quite literally wrote the book on the strike. The Broken Table is nearly 400 pages long and it covers so much more than we could here from the joint operating agreement to the court battles. And I also feel like I should point out just how important newspapers remain in the media landscape and as watchdogs. Remember, it was the Detroit Free Press investigation that led to Kwame Kilpatrick's fall from grace. It was an investigation that cost millions of dollars and no citizen journalist could have done that. It also led to a Pulitzer Prize one of two that the free press has won since the strike.